All right, I'm ready to go. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to DevOx. Welcome to test-driven security with Spring. I'll quickly introduce myself while we... There's a bit of an echo. Is there a way to fix that? Okay. Um, I'll introduce myself quickly while people are still coming in. So my name is Elefteria, or you can call me Ria, and I'm a software engineer. I am currently working at a company called Stacklock, who is hiring, so I put a link to the careers page up there. Before that, I worked as an agile consultant at a company called Pivotal. And what that means is I would work side by side with an engineer from our customer team, and together we would build an application using agile methodologies like test-driven development and pair programming, and then deploy an application to production. And that's where I learned about test-driven development and really gained an appreciation for it and saw how useful it can be when developing these production-grade applications. After that, I spent a few years on the Spring security team. There, I got to dive deeper into the Spring framework, learn more about the test support that's offered there, security in general. But specifically, the testing security component was interesting to me because it's something I hadn't done before. So those two experiences combined are what made me want to make this talk and share some of the things that I've learned along the way with you. So I'm really happy I got to be here today. I saw that tickets sold out in something like four seconds, and that made me think one of two things is going on. Either this is going to be the greatest conference everyone's ever pulled off, or Taylor Swift is coming. I don't know, we'll find out. But as I was thinking about that, it got me thinking about Taylor Swift and the Eras tour, which is her latest tour. And I was thinking that's the way that they sold tickets for that tour is actually an interesting case study for authorization. So wouldn't it be a missed opportunity if we didn't make a ticket selling application today based on the Eras tour ticket se sellers? So that's what we're going to be doing today. Let's see an overview. I'm going to start off with some definitions. Really, it's just one definition, but it's an important one. And then most of the talk will be live coding. We're going to get an introduction to the Spring Security Test Support. We're going to see how we can test with custom users and when we might want to create a custom user. We're going to test with access control. And we're also going to test some authentication. In the end, I'm planning to leave 10 minutes for questions. Um, so if you have any questions, that would be the time to ask them. The most important definition that we're going to need for today is the definition of test-driven development. And here it says, test-driven development, or TDD, is a technique for building software where feature development is guided by writing tests. That means that when you're doing test-driven development and you want to add a new feature, you'll first write the test, the test for the functionality that you want to add. The test will fail at first because you don't have any production code. And then you'll write the production code that's necessary to make the test pass. The goal will always be to write the minimal amount of code necessary in order to make the test pass. And that's the technique we're going to be following today. So now let's go ahead and build a ticketing application. I have created a skeleton application, which means I don't have any useful code in here. I've just pre-created some files and added some imports so that I don't have to do them during this talk. The first piece of functionality that we're going to add is going to be kind of a warm-up to get everyone familiar with the concept of test-driven development. And we're not going to touch on any of the security functionality yet. So the first piece of uh, functionality that we want to add is going to be an overview endpoint that's going to give users an overview of our website. So let's write a test for that. We can say the test is called overview returns site overview. We can perform a get request to the overview endpoint. Then we can expect that the status we get back is OK. And that alone is not particularly 
uh, useful. So we can also expect something on the content and say that the content we get back is a string that says, get your tickets for the record-breaking tour. Now I'm going to run this test, and you will see that it's going to fail as intended because we don't have the endpoint created yet. But after we see this fail, we'll go ahead and write the code to make this pass. So if we come to our test, we see that it expected a 200 response, but it got back a 404, meaning the endpoint wasn't found. So let's come to our controller. And here we can create the overview endpoint. So we're creating a get mapping for overview. We're calling the method site overview. And then we can return the same overview string that we saw before. And now if I run my test, this should be enough to get it to pass. And it's green now. So let's come back to our tests and think about something a little bit more security-centric. Let's think about users. We'll introduce that concept of a user now. We would like our users to be able to log in. And once they're logged in, we would like to greet them based on what their username is. So if we have a user called Rhea, we can welcome them and say, welcome Rhea, for example. So let's write a test for that. Here we're saying that greeting returns welcome and the username. We're making a get request to the greeting endpoint. We're expecting that the status is OK. And we'll also add an expectation on the content here that is the string, let's say, welcome Rhea in this case. Now, in order for this test to pass, we're going to need a way to simulate making this request as a user. And the user should have the username Rhea. To do that, we can bring in Spring Security as well as the Spring Security test support, because it will provide us with functionality to do that. So let's come to our uh, dependencies here. And we can add the Spring Security dependency. And we can also add the Spring Security test dependency. And then when I come back to my test, as I'm making this request to the greeting endpoint, I can use something called a post processor and use the user post processor, which comes from the Spring Security test support, and pass in the username Rhea. And what this post processor does is it associates a user with the username Rhea, in this case, to the request that we're making. You can create other fields on the user, but for our purposes in this test, just adding the username is enough. One more thing I have to do to make this test work is when I'm setting up mock MVC, I also have to apply Spring Security here. Now, if I run the test, it's going to fail. And then I can see why it failed and figure out a way to fix the error message. So again, we're getting the 404 saying that this endpoint doesn't exist. So we'll come to our controller and add an endpoint to make the test pass. We are creating a get mapping for greeting. And in here, I'm going to use something else that Spring Security provides, which is the authentication principle annotation. And I'm going to supply it an expression here called username. What this will do is, from the principle that's coming in, it'll extract the username and put it in the variable here that I've called username. Then in the return, I can return welcome, and then the user's username. And run my test, and expect that now it'll pass. Now, one of the reasons for having a test suite is so that we make sure, as we're adding new functionality, we're not breaking any of the existing functionality. In this scenario here, I'm going to run my whole test suite again. And we'll notice that I broke my first test. And we see here that I got an unexpected status. The expected status was 200, but the status that I got was 401, which means unauthorized. To explain that, let's come to the build.gradle. 
And notice that I added Spring Security here. One important thing to know is that as soon as you add Spring Security, it's going to try and keep your application secure by default. What that means in this case is that it's going to secure all the endpoints so that only authenticated users can access them. So our overview endpoint, which used to be open to the public, now is only accessible to authenticated users. I don't think that's something that we would want, though. We would like our overview endpoint to be accessible to anyone. There's nothing specific to having a logged in user that's required for this endpoint. So I'd like to change the behavior and open up this endpoint so that anyone, authenticated or not, can access it. The way to do that is if I come here to my security config that's currently empty, I'm going to first make this class uh, configuration. And then in here, I'm going to create a bean. And the type of bean that I'm going to create is a security filter chain bean. If you've used older versions, or if you're still using older versions of Spring Security, maybe you're on Spring Boot 2 line, you might have up here in your security configuration class extended another class called the Web Security Configure Adapter, and then overridden a method that's called Configure HTTP Security. That's the same HTTP security that you're seeing here. And then you might have added these custom security configuration options. In the newer versions of Spring Security, there is a better way to do that, which is by creating this security filter chain bean. You can get an instance of HTTP security that's pre-created by Spring Security. Then you can add your customizations. In this case, we're saying that we want users to log in using form login. And we're saying that for any request that comes in, the user has to be authenticated. Then we're building HTTP security, which returns an instance of the security filter chain. Now, the security filter chain is what the name describes. It's a chain of security filters that get executed one by one as your request comes in. So this filter chain that you're building here is what's actually applied to your requests as soon as a request comes in. The configuration that I've added here is similar to the default and saying that any request has to be authenticated. But for our purposes, what we would uh, like to do in order to make all our tests pass is say that for any request, anyone is permitted to access it. And this should be enough to get both of the tests to pass. And it does. Coming back here, though, let's reassess if this is actually the configuration that we want. I'm thinking that for the greeting endpoint, we should require a user to be logged in. Because we're greeting them by, based on their username, it only really makes sense for logged in users. So I'm going to create another test to see what happens when an unauthenticated user tries to access this endpoint. And I'm going to expect that they're not allowed to access it. So let's come and write that test here. And we're saying that if somebody tries to perform a GET request to the greeting endpoint, we're not using any kind of user post processor here, so we're not making this request as an authenticated user. We expect that the status is a redirection, and it redirects to the login page. Now, this test is going to fail because that's not what I said I wanted in my security config. So after we see this fail, we can come here and change this so that when we're giving our authorization logic, we can say that for a request that matches the overview endpoint, anyone's permitted to access it. But for any other request, the user has to be authenticated. And then if I run this test, I get the intended functionality. Now, so far, we've just been able to use the default built-in Spring Security user. But thinking more about our specific use case, we're going to be selling tickets. And our users might have more information than simply a username and password. They might, for example, want to know what the nearest venue is to them where one of the shows is playing. So what I'd like to do is extend the um, default user implementation and add some customizations to it. 
And uh, the reason for that is the next endpoint that I want to add is an endpoint where a user can get the nearest venue to them. So let's start off with writing that test. We're going to perform a get request to the nearest venue. We're going to expect that the status is OK. And we're going to expect that Amsterdam, Netherlands is the nearest venue to that user. Similarly to what we did before, where we had a user that we were simulating making this request as, we'd like to do something similar again. But as I was saying, the default Spring Security user doesn't have any concept of nearest venue. So we're going to go ahead and extend that. I have a class here called fan. And this fan class is going to represent our users. For now, let's focus on the first few fields and specifically the nearest venue field. This is the piece of information we'd like to get from our user. But right now, this is simply a class, and it's not connected to Spring Security in any way, as in Spring Security doesn't know that this is supposed to represent a user. The way to do that is to implement an interface called user details that comes from Spring Security. And I could do that here, but I'm going to do something a little bit better. I'm going to come to a different class, this fan service class. And in here, I'm going to create another class. And I'm going to call it fan details. And what this class is going to do that's interesting is it's both going to extend the fan class that we just saw and also implement user details. The advantage of that is that when Spring Security is looking at my user, it can treat it as a user details instance. But once we get into our business logic, then we can treat this as an instance of fan and don't have to worry about the other fields that are necessary for our security purposes, like whether this person's account is locked. So now that we have this fan details, we can use this in our test. So let's create a fan. And let's set a nearest venue to be Amsterdam. And then we're going to use the user post processor again. But now we're going to pass in an instance of fan details using the fan that we just created. So now I have everything set up to be able to run this test. It's not going to pass. We know that by now. but. Um, at least it's set up correctly. So if we look at why it fails, the usual 404 not found, I haven't created the nearest venue endpoint. So I'll come to my controller, and I will create a get mapping for nearest venue. It's once again using the authentication principle annotation, but as I was mentioning earlier, once we get here into our business logic, we can start treating this as an instance of fan rather than fan details. And then in our business logic here, we can do fan, get nearest venue, and simply return that. I do have one other test to add just for completeness here. I'm going to test that um, if I try to get the nearest venue without being authenticated, then I redirect to the login page. But we just saw this, so I'm not going to go through this example again. The next thing that I want to look at has, again, to do with my custom user. And since now we've greeted them and show them the nearest venue to them, it makes sense that we should allow them to book tickets now. So let's um, come to our fan again and look at some of these additional fields that we have here. So we have a string called show. And this is the show that this fan has booked. And then we also have a Boolean called Swifty. Now, going back to the Taylor Swift example, um, Taylor Swift fans are called Swifties. And the reason for having this Boolean here is based on, again, the interesting system that these ticket sellers used to determine who can buy tickets. So what they did is not everyone was eligible to even attempt to buy tickets. You had to be a certain kind of user 
to even get in line, in the virtual line, to attempt to buy a ticket. And they use some kind of algorithm to determine if you are a true fan or somebody that might try and resell the tickets. And we're going to call that the Boolean Swifty. So if you're a true Swifty, this is true. If you might be reselling the tickets, then this is going to be false. So our test here is that we would like to allow users to book a show, but only if they're Swifties, not just any regular fan. So let's go ahead and write a test for that. Here we're creating a fan. We're setting Swifty to be true. We're making a post request to the show endpoint, trying to make this person book uh, the show in Amsterdam. And then we're using the user post processor again with the fan that we just created. Let's run this. And it fails. But if we look at the failure reason, we see that we get a 403 response, which is not the typical 404 that we've been seeing so far. We might have expected a 404 because the show endpoint doesn't exist, but instead we've gotten a 403. This goes back to what I was saying earlier about Spring Security trying to keep your application secure by default. And because this is a post request that we're making and it modifies data, Spring Security is going to require a valid cross-site request forgery token in this request. And this is a way to prevent cross-site request forgery attacks. I'm not going to go through um, what that type of attack is, but I will have a reference to the Spring Security documentation um, in one of the slides at the end, and you can read about it there. But for the purposes of what we're doing now, we need to know that if we're performing a post request or a delete request or a put request, we will need to have a valid token when we're making the request. We can use another post processor to do this. So I can say, in addition to making this request with a user, I'm also going to simulate making it with a valid token. And now running the test, I expect that it will fail with a 404 not found. And indeed, it does. So let's come to our controller. And we will add the endpoint for booking a show. It's a post mapping to the show endpoint. We're going to get the authentication principle, and we're going to get the show. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm not going to actually do the data operations of setting the show on the fan and saving it. I'm just going to print out a string and essentially say that this user is lucky for having gotten a ticket, because a lot of people didn't. So now, running the test again, we will expect that this will pass. All right. As I was saying, we only want certain users to be able to book shows. So we're going to have to add some authentication here, which means we're going to have to add another test. Our next test is going to be if we have a fan, just a regular fan, that tries to book the show. They try to book the Amsterdam show. And they do have a valid token that they get a forbidden response saying that they're not allowed to book it. If I run this test, it's going to fail because we don't have any of this authorization logic set up in our security config yet. To make it pass, I can come here and I can add another request matcher saying that if you're trying to book a show, then you have to have the authority that is Swifty. Let me explain where this comes from. In our fan details here, since we're extending the user details interface, we have to supply a way to get the user's authorities. In the get authorities method here that we override from the user details, we're saying that every user will have the authority fan, but only if the Boolean Swifty is true, does the user also get the authority Swifty. So that's where this authority here comes from in the security config as well. So let me run this test. And now it passes. The next piece of functionality that I want to add comes from 
a true story. And this happened to somebody, let's just say a friend of mine. They were trying to book two tickets to a show. And the show was happening both on Monday and on Tuesday. And so this person looked at the Monday available tickets and saw that they only had tickets way at the back. So then they opened a new tab and looked at the Tuesday tickets and saw that for Tuesday, there are no seats together. There's one seat on one side of the stadium and one seat on the other side of the stadium. So they said, okay, that's not what I want. They closed the tab, went back to the Monday tab, went through the whole flow of buying the tickets. And then what happened? They got an email saying, thank you for booking the Tuesday show with one seat on one side of the stadium and one seat on the other side of the stadium. Now, to be fair, the website did say don't open multiple tabs, but this person was still not happy with that. So they called customer support and said, you know, sorry, I opened two tabs, but the tickets for Monday are still available and they're together. I don't really want the tickets that are on opposite sides of the stadium. And the customer support people essentially said, don't open multiple tabs. These are your tickets now. So inspired by um, that situation, we're going to add some new functionality for somebody that's logging in as a customer support employee. And this person is not necessarily a fan, so they're not going to use the same fan login method that we've been creating so far. They're going to log in through a different system, let's say the company login system. So in other words, we're going to be using OAuth2. And we're going to be making this application here into a resource server. Um, in the, I will have a slide later of talks that are related to this one. And there are several OAuth2 OpenID Connect talks that I'll have linked up there if you want to learn more about OAuth2 and resource servers. For the purposes today, what you need to know is that um, this customer support agent is going to log in through a different service. Then they'll get a token. They'll send us the token. And in this application here, we'll use the token to determine if the user has the right privileges. So let's write a test. Here we're saying that if one of these support staff try to perform a GET request to the, to the support tickets endpoint, then they will get the status OK. And inspired by the real world scenario, they'll be told to tell the customer that they should have stayed in one tab. So we're simulating here, making the request as a user, similarly to what we did before with the user post processor, but we can actually do better. We can use a different post processor which is for JWTs or JSON web tokens. And instead of supplying a user, we can simulate making this request with a token, which is much more realistic to what real customers are going to be doing, and therefore is going to make our tests more robust. Now, to craft this token, we're going to have to bring in another dependency, which is the resource server dependency. Nope. Uh, there we go. The Spring Boot Starter OAuth2 resource server. And this is going to bring in the JWT class, as well as some other functionality that we'll need in a little bit. So in my class here, I can create one of those tokens. And I'm adding a header, um, an, an algorithm header here. I'm setting the subject claim. But most importantly, I'm setting a scope claim here, saying that th this person has the scope support. Then I can use this token to simulate making the request. And this test, you know the drill, is going to fail. And it fails because the endpoint doesn't exist. So let's first make this test pass by adding the endpoint. 
Now, you might say that this should go in a different controller, and that would make sense, but just for the purposes of today's talk and keeping everything in one place, I'm just going to put it in this controller. And yeah, this uh, endpoint is not particularly helpful. It just says, should have stayed in one tab. And if I run my test now, this should be enough to make it pass. Now, we were saying only certain people should be able to access the support endpoints. And so we're going to require that only people that have the scope support should be able to access the uh, support tickets endpoint. So let's write a test for when unauthorized people try to access the support endpoint. We're creating another valid token here. Um, but this one doesn't have the claim that's saying the user has the support um, scope. And so we would expect that they get back the response forbidden. If I run this test, though, it will fail because we don't have anything in our security configuration that talks about users with certain scopes being able to access endpoints. So let's come to our security configuration and add that functionality. The way that I'm going to choose to do that today is by adding a second security filter chain. And I'm going to add it, and then we'll walk through what it means and what it's doing. So here, now we have two security filter chains, the support security filter chain and the original one that we had before. This one here has order one, which means it'll be executed first. When a request comes in, it'll first hit this filter chain before going to the next one. And this filter chain, the support security filter chain, the first thing it's going to do is check if the request matches support slash tickets. And if it doesn't, it'll kick it out of this security filter chain, and it'll go to the next one. What this means for our case is that all of the previous endpoints and requests that we created will continue to go to this first security filter chain and not to this new one. And sorry, by first, I mean this original one. So let's see what else this is doing. This is saying that for any request that comes in, the person has to have the authority scope underscore support. And I'll come back to this in a minute. And it's saying that the authorization mechanism for any requests that come in here is that this application is an OAuth2 resource server, and it's going to accept JWTs and validate them to determine the authorization of the user. Now, to make this, um, these JWTs work and to be able to validate them properly, we have to create one more thing, which is the decoder. So here we are creating a JWT decoder that will decode the incoming tokens. And I'm just using a public key that I created for test purposes here. Now, coming back to the scope underscore support, this is, again, something that Spring Security does under the hood. It will map the scope claim to an authority by prefixing all of your scopes with scope underscore and then putting the scope name. If we look at our test here, we saw that we had a claim called scope and it had the value support. So for this token that comes in, Spring Security will create the authority scope underscore support. If you had multiple values here, if you had, for example, support and super admin, then you would also have two authorities, scope underscore support, and scope underscore super admin. So that's where this comes from. One other thing that you might notice is that we're using the Lambda DSL here. I think it's been around for about five years now. But before that, you used to have to chain your security configures using dot and, like this. You no longer have to do that. Um, and I will point to another talk that's happening, I think, tomorrow that relates to upgrading Spring Security. So I'll have that in the related talk section as well if you're still on an older version and need some advice on how to upgrade. So this here should be enough to make my test pass. 
So let's run the test suite. And now all of the tests are green. So let's come back to the slides. We've built our application. That's all the coding I wanted to do for today. I do have some references here. The Spring Security Test Support documentation, which talks about things like cross-site request forgery. It talks about OAuth 2, resource servers, JWTs. And then the code from today will be up on GitHub in a few minutes. Um, once I head out of here, I will make it public. So it's not available quite yet, but give me a few minutes and it will be. There is also one commit per endpoint. So if you want to follow along with what we did today and build the application incrementally, you can just go through the commit history. Here's the list of related talks. So some of them have already happened, but the team here is so good at getting things up on YouTube that they're already up, so you can watch them there. Um, so we have Im implementing passwordless logins, which has to do with OAuth 2 and specifically the authorization server portion of it. Then there's an introduction to OAuth 2. Then the talk that I was talking about that has to do with upgrading Spring Security 6 is happening tomorrow. And then there is another talk about OAuth 2 and OpenID also happening tomorrow that also has some live coding. So if you enjoy that, I would check that one out as well. And yeah, now I'm done talking and I can take any questions you might have. No questions? <laughs> I saw in one of the talks they were giving away chocolates if you ask a question, but I don't have any, so I don't know why you're here. <laughs> All right, yeah, if there's no questions, you're free to go, but if you want to ask me a question later, come chat to me. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>